Mother-in-law shows up to my own wedding in a wedding dress? Have fun paying off these loans. Mother-in-law shows up to my own wedding in a wedding dress? Have fun paying off these loans. I had a very expensive, very fancy summer wedding with a husband I am incredibly in love with. Unfortunately, I am not in love with his family at all, and they don't like me either. My husband's mother in particular has always tried to one-up me in our relationship. For example, she chose to gift my husband a car on Valentine's Day. She also bought him a Rolex for his birthday, but his family isn't rich at all. I discovered that the car she bought was on lease even after she gave it to him and that the Rolex was the cheapest one on the market, which is still pretty expensive but not as impressive as it sounds at first glance. In any case, my mother-in-law constantly tries to make me seem like I'm less successful than her. I think it's because we both own our own law firms, but mine is very successful and has multiple offices while she has never had more than a handful of employees. In any case, I tried not to let it bother me too much because I'm so in love with my husband. The financial stuff never really irked me. However, at my wedding, my mother-in-law showed up in a gorgeous white dress. Without a doubt, it was fancier than mine and more stunning in every way. Her hair and makeup was done and everything. I don't know what she was thinking or what my husband was thinking when he saw her walk inside and didn't say anything, but I found out from my bridesmaids before I walked out what had happened. We started to make a plan to ruin the dress, which is pretty basic and petty but still fulfilling, but I never realized just how much it would ruin my mother-in-law's life. Go to part 2. Mother-in-law shows up to my own wedding in a wedding dress? Have fun paying off these loans. Part 2 halves. Mother-in-law shows up to my own wedding in a wedding dress? Have fun paying off these loans. Part 2. After my mother-in-law showed up to my own wedding in a fancier, prettier wedding dress, I knew something was up. She had already established a pattern of buying things more expensive than she could possibly afford, so I had a feeling that she either rented the dress, was borrowing it from a friend, or had traded her actual wedding dress for it. In any case, it was one of those dresses that had an incredibly delicate outer layer and was filled with fine detailing. Either a wine spill or a rip would have been enough to completely ruin it, but I wanted both to happen, just in case. So, with the work of a safety pin on her skirt and a little elbow magic, my darling best friend and bridesmaid managed to make it look like my mother-in-law not only spilled wine on herself, but also ripped her own dress. She actually screamed when it happened, and she immediately tried yelling at my bridesmaid, who had been the last to touch her and the careful orchestrator of the whole thing. Thankfully, there was no proof. It was very rewarding to hear her shriek from across the room, but I didn't bother giving her any attention. The rest of the guests followed my lead. The thing is, I was right. My mother-in-law didn't own the dress, she had rented it. And it was a dress that cost more than a new car in damages, even though it had been much more affordable on rent. As a result, my mother-in-law is now back in debt and has even taken out a loan to pay for the wedding dress. A part of me still very much hates that all this had to happen at my wedding, but honestly, it makes me smile. I feel like I got the final victory over that crabby old lady, and hopefully, she never tries to one-up me in my marriage again. My husband cheated on me with my own brother, so I told his homophobic mother. The beginning of my marriage with my husband was very picturesque, very happy, and very fulfilling. Our intimate life was great, we were in the same friend groups, and we each had jobs that we were genuinely passionate about. However, my husband got into a terrible car accident a little while back that changed everything. I quit my job for a year to take care of him, but it started to take a toll on our relationship. Our marriage counselor recommended that we hire a caretaker, since we could afford it, so that's what we did. We chose to keep money in the family by hiring my brother. Since my husband was injured, though, he wasn't working anymore. This basically meant that I was paying my brother to fall in love with my husband, which happened quicker than I could have ever expected. Around three months after I hired him, I started to get a weird feeling around my brother. He was staying at the house longer and later than he needed to, was acting strangely defensive whenever I asked him or my husband's questions about how they were doing, and he even tried to suggest that he should come along when my husband and I went abroad for our annual vacation. It was a complete shock, however, when I discovered them in bed together. I immediately fled my best friend's house and tried to figure out whether I was going to try to find a way to strike back at them or simply mope, and I finally settled on the revenge route. See, my husband's mother has extremely traditional values. I knew I was going to tell her the truth, but what I wasn't ready for, though, was how this would end up affecting my brother, me, and the rest of my family. Go to part 2. My husband cheated on me with my own brother, so I told his homophobic mother, part 2. After I realized that I had basically been paying for my brother to live it up while cheating with my husband on me, I was furious. At the same time, though, I couldn't understand why my husband wouldn't just break it off with me. Then, my best friend helped me realize the truth, my brother is a professional caretaker and basically has no savings whatsoever. At the same time, my husband and I have a prenuptial agreement with a very firm infidelity clause. With his injury, my husband's line of work was no longer a feasible option for him, which meant that he and my brother seemingly had no financial prospects, but my best friend helped me figure out that he was probably just waiting for his extremely wealthy, extremely conservative mother to pass away so that he could get the insane amount of money she's stored for him in her will. Once I knew he was cheating on me, though, I couldn't be brought to care at all for him. I drove to his mother's house in tears and she welcomed me into her home quickly, immediately asking what her son had done wrong. Now, I'm personally all in favor of freedom of sexual orientation. However, I hated my husband for cheating more than I wanted him protected, which is why I didn't hesitate to tell his Puritan mother that her son was gay. 
This caused an insane uproar in their family, and his parents were furious that he would not only cheat but cheat with someone who was technically a family member, as this was his brother-in-law. And, obviously, they were mad about him being gay, too. The end result is that he's been disowned and completely ostracized from his own family. My own brother is receiving similar treatment from my side of the family, and I'm serving divorce papers this week to my soon-to-be ex-husband. He and my brother will get to live happily ever after in poverty after all this is done. My dad always harasses me over college money, so I humiliated him in front of his brother. My dad has always been very intense. He set up this college fund for me, but there are a bunch of conditions. He wanted me to keep a minimum grade of B, be the one to approve my course choices, have weekly meetings to talk about my grades, and a bunch of other stuff. It would have been fine if my dad was like a regular dad, but he's a bit different. He's really intense. See, my dad has a quick temper. From middle school, I was always stressed about my grades, constantly getting yelled at or grounded for things that weren't even my fault. One time, a teacher didn't update my grades online, and I ended up with a zero for an assignment for a few hours before I sent her an email, and my father showed up to the varsity basketball game I was playing in and forced me to leave as punishment because he thought I just didn't do my work. My dad also would randomly search my backpack and locker to make sure I wasn't hiding anything. It was really stressful. So, I decided to pay for my own college. I didn't want to deal with all the tension of being constantly screamed at or worrying about my dad disapproving of my classes or grades. He got into a habit of saying but I'm the one paying thousands of dollars for your college whenever we disagreed over anything, even arguments as small as where to go for dinner, so I decided I'd rather have some debt than be controlled for four more years, you know? Anyway, I just finished my first year, and everything's going pretty well. But, the other day, my family got together for a 4th of July celebration. My family started talking about my cousin's school, and then my uncle turned to my dad and asked, Hey, how much is your kid paying for college? Because on their side of the family, the parents were paying for my cousin's college. There were no conditions there. And I just laughed and interrupted them, saying, why are you asking him? I'm the one paying for it. My dad got mad about that and said I completely embarrassed him. However, that's the truth. And if anyone asks me about it, I plan on being honest about the reason too. But am I being a jerk here? What's your best story of petty revenge? My friend Mandy and I have a very tense relationship. She's one of those stereotypical mean girls who makes things sound like compliments when they're actually really insulting. She likes to comment on whenever I'm looking cute, for once, or how it's so brave of me to wear clothes that show off my body. For my birthday, she bought me a nice white shirt that honestly looked pretty flattering, but I was suspicious because the tags were ripped off. I used reverse search on it and found out that it was one of those tops that looked perfectly fine under white light, which is exclusively what we have in our college dorms, but turns see-through under most other types of light. So, I thought I'd have fun with it. I tested how see-through it really was with a girlfriend I trusted, and it was bad. Then, a few weeks ago, Mandy had her own birthday party. It was a really small and intimate gathering and I honestly didn't know why I was invited. But, I decided to wear the white top. Of course, I picked my nicest bra to go with it. At the party, the guys were glued to me. None of them would leave me alone, and Mandy noticed and got really annoyed. She came up and said that I might have stretched the fabric to make it sheer because I was too big for the shirt, all while pretending to sound really sweet and concerned, so I just blinked at her and said, I mean, isn't the point of a see-through prank shirt that you can look at what's underneath? You actually bought me the perfect size, thanks, girl. She got really annoyed and asked me if I was seriously flashing every guy in the room, including her boyfriend, just to be petty. I shrugged and just gave her my own birthday gift, a napkin from Taco Bell with a post-it note that said she might like to wear it, if this was her opinion of high-coverage clothing. We haven't spoken since. My vegan daughter wants my whole family to quit meat, so I gave her two choices. My daughter decided recently that she wanted to be vegan. We've always been a meat-eating family, and bacon and eggs for breakfast is a tradition in our home. Still, my wife and I are trying our best to be fully supportive of her choice. We've been learning about vegan cooking, trying new recipes, and adjusting our budget to include vegan substitutes for her. It's been all good until recently. One day, she got upset when she saw me cooking bacon in a pan and rinsing it out for the dishwasher. She claimed that the pan I was using was her vegan pan and got really angry. I was surprised and explained that the pan is a family pan, older than she's been alive, and that she couldn't claim it. To make her feel more comfortable, I agreed to buy her a separate pan for vegan cooking. I even got her colored ones to help me remember not to use them by accident. But that still didn't solve the problem. She's now started saying that the dishwasher is contaminated with animal products and the fridge has bacon grease fingers on it because I touch it after cooking bacon. I do wash my hands, but even the slightest presence of meat seems to upset her. My daughter had an intervention with our family and said that she needed us all to go vegan, too. I was astounded. She wasn't even asking us, she was demanding. However, my daughter cooks less than either me or my wife and makes no contribution to all the expensive vegan groceries. I told her, in no unclear terms, that she could either continue to be vegan quietly while the rest of us ate meat, or she could go to her grandparents' house where they own a farm to see what the world really thinks about vegans. She started crying, calling me insensitive and mean, but I think she took it too far with all these demands. How do I get her to see my side? The scariest thing I ever saw as a hiker was not animals, but these people. During college, there was this awesome trail called the Loyal Sock Trail that was about an hour away from our university. It was known for being super cool, so I invited my friend to join me on a backpacking trip there. 
The plan was to hike the 50-mile trail over a four-day weekend. I had a lot of experience camping and backpacking, being an Eagle Scout and all. But let me tell you, the scariest thing you can find in the woods is not a wild animal, but other people. We were about 20 miles into the trail, surrounded by dense trees and underbrush, when I decided to walk about 100 meters off the trail. I figured we would be less likely to bump into anyone that way. My friend and I found this amazing spot on a peninsula where a creek met a river. It was pretty hidden, and we couldn't even see our flashlights from the trail. We set up camp, made a fire, cooked our food, and had a few drinks. Around midnight, we put out the fire and went into our tents. All was quiet. But then, I heard voices. The voices sounded way too close for comfort, considering we were 100 plus meters away from the trail. I checked my watch. It was 3 in the morning. Who hikes at 3 in the morning? We were 20 miles in, so it didn't make sense. Slowly, I got out of my sleeping bag and unzipped my tent, only to find my friend peeking out of his tent in the exact same way. He made an exaggerated, shh, signal with his finger on his lips and urgently motioned towards the trail. And there they were. Four adults, three men and one woman, walking straight towards our camp. They were walking silently, without any lights. Only one of them had a backpack, which seemed strange for a long hike. I grabbed my survival knife, feeling a bit scared and disheveled. I knew a knife wouldn't offer much defense. But then, the weirdest thing happened. These people walked straight into our camp, sat down by our fire pit, and just sat there for what felt like forever. Go to part 2. The scariest thing I ever saw as a hiker was not animals, but these people. Part 2 halves. My friend asked them what they were doing in our campsite, but they didn't answer. Instead, they asked if we had any food. We had packed light for the trip, but I managed to toss one of our extra meals to one of the men. In rapid succession, I asked them why they weren't using lights, if they needed help finding the trail, and why they were hiking so late. Their answers gave me the creeps, we don't use lights, we know where the trail is, it's better to hike late at night, they said. At this point, my friend asked them to leave. They asked if we wanted to start the fire again and hang out, but we definitely didn't want that. It was terrifying, being around four adults who were both older and stronger than us with nothing for defense except for my measly pocket knife, which was probably dull since the only thing I ever used it for was cutting open boxes. Finally, they picked up their bag, got up, and left without saying another word. We watched them leave and took turns making sure they didn't come back at night. Needless to say, we didn't get much sleep. When the sun came up, we finally got some real sleep. By the time we woke up in the afternoon, it all felt like a strange dream. The only evidence we had was a fuzzy cap that they must have dropped, which we recognized later on our trip and grabbed for evidence, just in case the worst happened. I still have it to this day. That was by far the weirdest and spookiest thing that ever happened to me in the woods. I hope it never happens again. In the 11 years since that trip, I haven't gone back to the Loyal Sock Trail. If you're planning on going, bring extra flashlights. And, I guess, extra food in case you run into hikers like those. What are the real secrets to a fulfilling life? I'm 55 years old, and here's what I've learned about life. Money is important, but it's not everything. It can't give you comfort or a warm hug when you need it. Instead of spending your money to make more money, allow yourself to spend money on things you value and self-care packages. Weekly massages can and will change your life, if you can afford it. On that note, take care of your body. Watch your weight, blood pressure, and don't smoke. So many of the people with serious health issues have at least one of these habits. If you can sidestep these vices, you're already improving things for yourself in the long run. Also, don't compare yourself to others. Be happy for them, but remember that you don't have to be exactly like them to be happy. Allow yourself to feel pride at your own achievements and try your best to be genuinely happy when others find success. They'll know if you're being authentic or not, and if you're friends with successful people, it's more likely that you, too, will find or remain successful. So don't stress about the little things. Stress can really take a toll on your health, and it almost never helps you. Instead, follow your dreams. Life goes by really quickly, and you don't want to look back at 80 years old and regret not doing the things you've always wanted to do, like traveling or pursuing your passions. Try your best to put small but consistent time towards your true hobbies. And know that you can change yourself, but you can't change someone else. Whether it's a friend or a partner, their flaws won't magically go away, and you can't save them. Don't waste your time on toxic people. Do kind things for others. It will make your life more fulfilling and meaningful. What's the scariest thing you've seen in the dark? I used to work as the county historic preservationist in southern Appalachia. It was a pretty cool job because I got to take care of old buildings and live on site at one of the historic properties. The house was this big brick mansion from the Victorian age or something, and my little house was just 20 feet away. To keep out unwanted visitors, the county put up a tall fence with barbed wire all around the property. It seemed impossible for anything to get in or out. One night, after finishing work late, I drove up to the entrance gate, let myself in, and locked it behind me. It was dark, so I could only see by the headlights of my car. As I turned the corner and parked, my lights hit something I can't really describe. It was about the size of a deer, but it had long, thin legs and shaggy hair. Kind of like a really tall maned wolf, if you've seen one of those. It freaked me out because there was no way it should have been able to get past or over the fence. I'm not kidding, this is what happened. I got out of the car to get a better look at the creature. Just as I opened the door and stepped out, it took off running. But get this, it wasn't running on all fours like an animal it was running on two legs. I watched in disbelief as it stood up straight and sprinted away. I was totally freaked out at that point. I quickly grabbed my flashlight and shotgun from inside and searched for any sign of the creature. 
but there was nothing, no tracks, no evidence of how it got in or out of the property, I have no clue what it was, that night, I couldn't sleep at all, I sat on my couch, clutching my shotgun, and kept an eye on the front door, I was just hoping that whatever I saw wouldn't come back and try to break in, I still can't explain what happened, but every time I think about it, it gives me the creeps.